Mr Drury and the Chief Executive and I have a commitment to try and find a date in our respective diaries um, as soon as possible to, uh, to con continue those. Um, it's kind of an inevitable consequence if you take $60 million you know, out of cash generating assets and you put them into ones that are not generating cash for a period of time that there will be, um, there will be a negative impact on cash flows. Um, and uh, collectively we need to figure out how to minimise that gap. Councillor Dick, you had your hand up. Mic microphone, please. My question is um, directed at giving a bit of advice to me, and that is, should I, as a governor, be focusing on the four condition precedents and whether they're satisfied or not, and also the issue of the funding gap over two years, how that's uh, likely to be managed if the condition precedents are met? Or should I be requesting and delving into in great detail every spreadsheet, every piece of financial and economic analysis to do my job properly? You, you guys go first. <laughs> it's directed at Hbrick. Well, well, I would suggest that um, that that if. if uh, the condition precedents are the, the, by far and away the most important part of this document. Um, sorry, I wasn't talking into that microphone. They're by far and away the most important parts of this document. They're the material issues that make or break, the, break whether it works or not. Um, I, I can tell you this. In terms of the financial modelling around this exercise, it has been through hundreds of iterations. It's been, it's been tested. We've had two financial models running between ourselves and one of the institutional investors. Uh, those models, those model assumptions have been reiterated and reiterated and tested, uh, and tested under a variety of assumptions. So uh, I, I think it's um, the, the point being is ultimately the conditions precedent that have emerged have been the, the primary the primary signposts as to whether, whether it's viable or not. I think the issues are quite simple, and not complex at all. And, and if I could add to that, um, the condition precedent noted in 20.3, securing the private um, and other public funding required to build the um, scheme infrastructure. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, the other institutional investors uh, will be uh, examining everything with a very fine tooth comb. Um, and you might imagine um, that um, Crown Irrigation Investments, um, given the lengthy um, and complex process they will have to go through uh, to get shareholder and treasury approval to invest, will be doing precisely the same. So um, these four conditions precedent are not in the least trivial. Um, they are all extremely difficult hurdles to get over. And if they are all got over, <coughs> Um, and have a tick in all four boxes, um, then uh, I think you could probably say that the process has been pretty robustly tested. Thank you. Councillor Beerman. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> a couple of questions. Um, one seeking clarification. Um, in, this, in this business case, I read that um, it's anticipated that if the dam goes ahead, we create another 2,500 jobs in this region. The press statement that went out yesterday, I think it was, says 2250, and the figure that I've seen previously was 2250. Can you clarify which is the correct figure and the source that it's derived from, please? Um, so the number in the butcher report is 2520, not 2250. A number of people seem to have seen a 2250 number somewhere, and if that has been promulgated, then I believe that's a typographical error. Uh, but the butcher report says 2520. And we have said here, um, with a small amount of rounding, we have said more than 2,500. OK, thanks, um, Andy. That's, um, that's good clarification, because it certainly hasn't been picked up by some people inside um, this office. Um, the second question I've got relates to the conversation you had just before about um, the 
dividend stream not not coming on over the next two years, and, and um, there will be discussion, I'm sure, about the um, shortfall in our cash flow um, as a consequence of that. And this relates back to the issues that we now have at the port, and maybe it's something that um, Jim, as chair, might like to consider asking, uh, answering. Um, is that two-year shortfall still, still a realistic one in view of the um, investment in machinery and so forth that the port might now have to consider making? Through you, Mr. Chairman, um, the port's dividend profile that they've given to to HBRIC, and um, HBRIC has passed on to um, HBIC, talks about an increase, a, a dividend increase this year, next year, and and 15, 16. And council have come back and and identified a shortfall of 2.6. Three million over the or three years over the two years. Two, but the key one is 2.6 million in the in the in the 15 in the 15 16 year. So your question sort of go goes beyond that because in the 10 year plan for the um, port, the dividend does increase in the 17 18 year from approximately eight million dollars to 11 to 11 million dollars. So um, the question is, will the port be in a position? Be in a position to pay that and and do the capex that uh, that it's got. Currently, this year, the port's capex plan is in excess of forty million dollars. And yesterday, on Monday, the port board approved fourteen million dollars of that, which is capacity capacity driven. And it's possible that we'll be bringing forward some capex plan for the fifteen sixteen year into into next year, uh, over and above that. So, I would have said that the Forward figures after the 15-16 year will be achievable um, because there is room in our debt profile in those out years, the 16-17 year in particular, to actually keep our debt up <laughs> to, at the higher end, at the higher end of our, our facility, whereas it was it was budgeted to come down in the 16-17 year. So. You're asking a question in terms of capacity. If the current level of growth at the port continues, and we've seen an increase in the last four months of over 20% in terms of container volumes, if that continues, I think you're asking a really relevant question because it may be that um, we will be saying to fund that level of growth or to fund the capital for that level of growth might be might be hard on us all. So just to, and there's another element to this as well, Jim, that you might like to respond to, and that is um, I note in on page uh, 12 of the business case, um, we talk about some other infrastructural developments, including um, the um, Napier Port Rail Hub, um, and the suggestion here is that the timing, it's on hold and it might be five to ten years, in the light of the congestion we're currently looking at, do we need to reconsider whether we shouldn't be bringing that forward? The reason that it's that it's on hold is because we can't get an economic return and 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 meet the meet the targeted rate of returns for, for the business. And I don't think that will change. We have to find some other ways to accommodate the growth rather than the Walker Two Hub. Have a comment to um, <coughs> Dr. Pierce and um, Councillor Dick. Um, I see my responsibility here is um, robustly ensuring that the plan protects the ratepayers, either as a direct liability or contingent liability. And I don't see these other investors doing that for our ratepayers. And I don't feel capable of doing it myself at the moment. So, as I say, I await your business plan. We we had 41 questions over here. I think we got through one, did we, or maybe two. <laughs> um, I don't have all day to sit here, Councillor Bell, I'm sorry, uh, much as I would like to. I, I don't believe that um, unless there's any s pressing um, areas of, that need clarification today, I'd like us to actually move on. Uh, we, we have a very full day. Chairman, so, can I make a suggestion? Which yes. might help uh, Councillor Belford. If, um, Councillor Belford was um, was happy to submit his questions to us, you know, in, in writing. I'm sure we could um, address a number of them. I'm happy to do that. 
Sure. Absolutely. Uh, it's building off of uh, what Councillor Hewitt asked, and I'd go the other direction. Uh, the, the, the total capping from a ratepayer angst standpoint, the total capping of exposure of the council to this project, if it proceeded, you've identified, for example, in point 187, uh, a hard exit by, by the Irrigation Authority, which might have a price tag of 12 to 24 million dollars. Uh, I can imagine other situations that might uh, reduce the cash flow uh, available to this project. Uh, if those kinds of, of uh, contingencies, in fact, materialize, is there, in fact, a hard $80 million cap on what ratepayers would be exposed to in this project? Or if not, where are the contingencies that might cause that number to need to be reconsidered at some later date by this council? It's my understanding that the $80 million number that is being talked about um, is the $80 million that was set out, the up to $80 million that was set out in the long-term plan and in the whole series of other council decisions about the maximum that the council would be willing to invest in, in equity um, in the project at the beginning. In the current formulation, um, and this is obviously subject to change depending on what happens in the remainder of the capital raise, um, that would give uh, HBRIC about 39% equity um, in the limited partnership. If we could raise more money, f sorry, that at, at $72 million, which is our which is the expected number uh, in this uh, business document, uh, that would give HBRIC 39% of the equity. To the extent that we could, contra Councillor Hewitt's um, preference, raise significantly more money through the Tuki Tuki Investment Limited Partnership, for example, um, and we invested $60 million or $50 million or some smaller number, then we would obviously have a lower equity proportion. But on the case as presented, at 39% of equity, that is how the 12 to $24 million um, requirement uh, for the payback to the Crown, you know, at a hard exit, is calculated. It's 39% of the range of money that could perhaps have to be paid back um, to, uh, to the Crown on a number of different uptake scenarios, but all of them being low. Um, I believe what we say in the document is that HBRIC itself should be able to manage such a matter, and so in it's most unlikely that HBRIC would need to come back to Council to seek an equity injection. We set out in the document the range of possibilities for us financing that ourselves. Fifteen years from now, um, we don't currently have any debt on our balance sheet, for example, so we, would, we should be able to raise money to fund that. Um, but the broad answer to your question, I believe, is that to the extent that HBRIC is an equity owner in the limited partnership, it will bear its proportional responsibility for both upside and downside. If the project goes significantly better, we get a better share. If there are things that go wrong, HBRIC gets 39% if that's its equity position. It has to figure out how it's going to resolve 39% of whatever the problem is. And I don't think it's possible to give you a hard number to say what that might be. Councillor Scott. Yes, Mr Chairman, I did have a number of other questions. I'm quite happy to take them up because they're really for, for my information and my understanding, so I'll take them up later. But there's one in particular, if I could refer to the graphs on page 20 and 21, 
I think this is some of the most stunning information that caught me um, by surprise when I read this report. Um, I don't want to ask you to identify because I realise that there is confidential information in there. But could you give us some indication know. around... OK, I'll accept that you don't know either. Around, in which case you may not be able to answer this question. Of all of those amazing number that sit around that median point, because we've been hearing so much about how expensive the scheme is, in fact, this is showing that New Zealand wide the water is not, what would the um, uptake be of those other schemes coming in at that price, as pe as particularly those, I suppose, with new development, but obviously some of those have been around for some time, so have been tested at that price? Generically speaking, I'd best to answer that. Uh, generically speaking, those schemes that are at or around the similar, um, nor I'll call it a normalised water price because the whole capital structure and, you know, it's different. Um, and some of these schemes, uh, they've moved to full uptake. So it's a, uh, and I'll go back to the comment I made earlier, uh, that at, and some of those schemes too with that sort of water price, it's fair to say that they are historic. So in other words, um, they've been there for a number of years. And the infrastructure, it's an infrastructure upgrade. So what's happening actually is, particularly in the South Island, is uh, there's a number of schemes moving off, um, off, off very old distribution um, water races technology, the pipe technology, so, so you know, systems. So the price is reflective of that. Um, uh, but but uptake, and, and I'll go back to the point I made earlier, is that the hardest sell on this deal is the first 40% when there's no reservoir, there's no <coughs> pipe, there's no water plant. 